We'll just Acts 9. Donna, do they have to stay out of the gym? No? Okay. Okay, 1 Samuel 9 and Acts 9. We'll just kind of keep those places open. And we'll go back and forth between these two. Scientists say that uh, we lose some of our organs of the past because they were vestigial. Uh, And it would be handy to have a tail right now because you could put your tail right between the mark of the Bible and go back and forth. And I think that's why in back some suit coats they have a little slit back there. That's in case you had the tail. So it could go between that slit. You know, but oh well. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask that you help us to understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us see this idea, this truth. Uh, help us to be uh, sincere people that uh, our consciences, as well, with the Spirit of God, will... Uh, be a, a guide to us to be faithful to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, there's two guys in the Bible. First Samuel 9 is a guy named Saul of the tribe of Benjamin uh, under the Old Testament that started off good and ended up bad. And you have a guy named Saul from the tribe of Benjamin who started off bad and ended up good. And both of them in chapter 9 is where they were given a certain commission for their lives. Okay, so King Saul of the Old Testament was uh, chosen in Act, in 1 Samuel 9. And Saul in the New Testament was chosen in Acts chapter 9. So you have two characters. The Bible runs these opposites a lot if you watch these things that the Lord does. <clears throat> you have two women in the Bible... Uh, two books in the Bible named after women, and one is a Gentile woman who marries a Jewish man, and the other one is a Jewish woman who marries a Gentile man. You have a fellow in the Old Testament who's not a Jew that became the father of the Jews, and then you have a fellow in the New Testament who's not a Gentile, but he became the apostle of the Gentiles. And so God does these opposite things quite often. And so you have a fellow named Saul in the Old Testament started off good, ended up bad. And a guy in the New Testament by the name of Saul from the tribe of Benjamin, both of them. And he started off bad, ended up good. And I want to look at both these guys, kind of look at uh, some inner qualities of their, of their life, of why they did a seesaw thing. It was a, this is a seesaw of the Saul's. Say that about ten times real fast. So it's going back and forth. On these things. So in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, verse 17, you see why God chose Saul under the Old Testament. 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. He says, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Okay, that's why he chose him. Now, how did this guy, Saul, who, who, became, who started off as a farm kid, did what his dad said, humbly followed his dad, ended up to be a sociopath, psychopath tyrant. How did he go from that in 1 Samuel 9 to demoniac suicide in 1 Samuel 31? How, what, was, what was that? How, what happened? Okay, and then how do you have a guy in the New Testament who started off a murderous persecutor of Christians to become the apostle to the Gentiles. Just a strange situation. In Acts 9, verse 15, uh, there's his calling, where he was called to be a guide to the Gentiles. So uh, I'm going to point out one unique characteristic that each of these men have, Okay, where one ruined it and the other one developed it. It's a very unique characteristic within a person's mindset. And I believe it's a key ingredient. It's a key characteristic that helps people maintain a long-term relationship. 
In our age, marriages over 20 years are rare. 20 years are rare. I remember hearing Paul Harvey where he would, he would uh, talk about people married 70, 71, 72 years. Remember where he'd often do that? I mean, that's an amazing thing. But today, 10 years marriage is rare. Why is that? Um, workers on the same job, 20 years, same job is rare. You see, athletes very rarely stay in the same team their whole career. Why is that? Um, faithful believers attending a Bible-believing church for 10 years is rare. What is it? I believe it's this one ingredient, this one characteristic. It's one key ingredient that will help maintain a relationship or a fellowship between imperfect people. And I believe it's the same ingredient that was part of the downfall of Saul, but it was also part of the uprising of Saul. One Old Testament, one New Testament. Okay, so if you're in 1 Samuel 9, if you just kind of, if you want to use your read speeding, read, uh, speeding skills, chapter 9 all the way through chapter 31 is the Bible's record of this fellow named Saul. A couple of times the camera moves off of him and goes to his son or to David. Okay, but basically when you read through there, you're going to see a man going from a humble farm kid doing what his dad told him to do to a psychopath or sociopath tyrant. Now, the difference between those two terms, the way I understand, is a sociopath or psychopath is a crim- has a criminal behavior. A sociopath has the mindset of that but doesn't commit the crime. Okay, so one is the basic attitude, and the other one has the actions going with the attitude. How can this guy, Saul, go from a farm kid to a sociopath, psychopath, where he actually took a javelin and tried killing his own son? He uh, did all he could, could to kill David. He killed an entire town just to get at David. He killed a bunch of priests just to get at David. How can a guy go from that to this? What was it that caused that? What was the subtle decisions that he made down that path? And I want to point them out. In chapter 9, you'll see that he obeyed his father's wishes. They lost a couple animals. He said, Saul, go out and find them. He was out there looking for them. Uh, And then he was going to go back because he thought his dad would worry about him. When he was out there looking for those uh, animals... Uh, Samuel crossed his path and he said, you're going to be king. After he was told that, he didn't brag about it. He didn't tell anybody about it. I mean, that's pretty impressive, I think. Uh, And then when he was coronated king, he was hiding. He didn't want the attention, didn't like the attention. It bothered him. Why? Because he was little his own sight. And in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, it says that he ruled one year. So for one year, he ruled... For the sake of the people. He did what he could to help the people for one year. And then in that second year, you'll start noticing very subtle decisions where he starts going down. On the second year. Now, he ruled for 40 years. So, 38, 30, over 38 or 39 years, he was uh, ruling in his, self, in his self-interest. What, what, what were the decisions that he made that went down this path? Now, I'm not saying that if a person makes these first one, two, or three decisions, that they're going to end up like him. I'm just pointing out that's what happened to him. And if a person keeps going down this path, depending on circumstances, it may not get that bad, but some things will happen. Chapter 13, verse 1, Saul reigned one year when he had reigned two years over Israel. Verse 2, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel. So he had 3,000 chosen men in an army. He took 2,000 under his command. His son Jonathan took 1,000. You'll see that in verse 2. Notice in verse 3, Saul or Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear, and all Israel hear say that Saul had smitten a garrison 
First thing, very subtle, seems to be minor. He took credit for somebody else's victory. Somebody else did something, and he took the credit to himself. Now, I know in the political realms, a lot of times people at the top get credit for something done even though they don't do it. But still the idea, I would dare say he should have broadcast Jonathan had smitten a garrison. Very subtle, seems to be minor, but often little steps, a bunch of little steps big, lead to a big thing. Next thing we read about this man, and again, I would encourage you to read down through it, chapter 13, verse 8. Before these Israelites would go into battle, they would often ask a priest to bless them before they went into battle, because under this governmental structure, their religion and government was interwoven. It was one and the same. And so in order for them to go to battle, they, they, politically speaking, they, they, that uh, they wanted a religious blessing. And so in this realm, Samuel was supposed to come at a certain time, have a religious blessing, and then they're going to go out to battle. And something happened, delayed it, and Saul jumped the gun. Verse 8, he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me and a peace offering, and he offered a burnt offering. What he's doing is he's doing something right in the wrong method. He's not supposed to do that. He has set himself up to be the king and the priest at the same time. This was a violation. This was against God. Verse 10, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And Samuel said, what hast thou done? What have you done, Saul? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me. Okay, oh. And that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. I forced, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. I didn't have a choice. Okay, what did he do? What did he do? He justified his unlawful behavior. He excused himself. Well, I didn't have a choice in the matter. Oh, yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, you did. It's, it's just a very subtle decision. You wouldn't think it's a major deal. And again, maybe not a major deal. But these small decisions, we keep reading. 13, Samuel said to Saul, thou hast done foolishly. At that time, in Saul's mind, he's disagreeing. No, I haven't. I did the right thing. I didn't have a choice in the matter. He's justified in his mind. That's what's going on. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. That was the plan A. Plan B is David. Boy, is he forfeiting something from what looks like to be a very small decision. Is it that big of a deal? 14, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people because thou hast kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Now that kingdom actually continues 38 more years. But he had the death sentence right then. Took a long time for it to complete. Now let's keep looking at this guy, looking at what he does, watch his behavior. Chapter 14, 24, he makes a very foolish idea, a very foolish decision. They're going to go out to battle. He was so mad, he said, okay, nobody's going to eat. No eating. And you try to go to battle without eating? Oh, you've got to be nuts. Chapter 14, 24, the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged of mine enemies. Uh, uh, desire for vengeance. Desire for vengeance, a foolish, a foolish thought. That's like a guy getting ready to play a basketball game and the coach says, okay, don't eat today. 
fast 24, then you play the game. What, are you crazy? That's what he's telling them to do. Verse 27, Jonathan didn't hear the order. Jonathan ate some food, did not hear about it. Chapter 14, verse 37, And Saul asked counsel of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he answered him not that day. God is done. God's not even answered a guy's prayer request. Oh, the Lord answers the prayers of all people who ask him. Mm, that ain't true. God is done with this guy at this point. And, and from our perspective, we're looking at it and saying, this doesn't look like to be a big deal. God is looking down the path where Saul is traveling. It's going to be manifest more and more to us as we read the record. God already saw that down the path. That's where this guy's heading. God sees this is where the guy's heading if he don't change, and it don't look like he's going to change. So far, all we've seen is he's taken credit for somebody else's victory. He's desired vengeance. He's justified himself when he was called on the carpet. Chapter 15, verse 3. Here's the direct command. Now, a person may or may not agree with this direct command from God. It doesn't matter. It's still the command. Now go and fight Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now, a person say, why would he do that? Well, you ask God why he does that. That's a long-standing thing. That's a, that's a long thing that took place years in the future. And evidently, it was such a bad situation. God says, you just got to wipe this out, man. These people are going to infect you. Probably, most likely, if you see the pattern is... There was sodomy, bestiality, and everything all wrapped in one. And God said, it's so far gone, they're done. Okay, so that's the order. Verse 3, that is the order. Wipe everything out. He doesn't obey the order. Chapter 7, I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 7. Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and fatlings and lambs and so forth and so on. He didn't obey the order. Let's watch his reaction when he's called on the carpet. Verse 10, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. He said, man, I've changed my mind. So, it grieved Samuel, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13. Here, Samuel comes into the presence of Saul. Watch Saul's reaction. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. This is a false piety. Oh, man, can Christians be pious? Oh, can they be pious? Oh, praise the Lord for what he's done. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. Yes, 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 yes. This is a false piety. I mean, you hear this all the time. If you don't, if you don't understand it, go knock on doors and find out how holy people are. I mean, just amazing. Christians are the best. The Lord has led me. Oh, he did. I mean, this is phenomenal how the Lord leads so many people contrary to the Bible. That's just amazing how that happens. So here they come right into the presence. Saul, Saul's old enough to know the terminology. You ever witness to somebody and they answer all the right questions? You walk away, man, them people lost as a goose in a horse race. Why? They know the terminology. They know how to appear spiritual. You say, what do you do about it? Nothing. You can't do anything about it. You can't do anything with anybody who don't admit any wrong. You just can't. That's why God didn't even answer his prayer. This guy's right about everything and ask him, he'll tell you. Blessed be thou the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. No, you didn't. You did not. 
Now, Samuel does not come and say, you did not. Samuel just says, oh, what meaneth this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears? Now, what am I hearing? And that's, that's a way to deal with people. Ask questions. Ask the right question and bring them under conviction. The question was designed to bring him under conviction, but you see, Saul has already been down that path. Verse 15, Saul said, they, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Notice he's blaming somebody else. He is blaming the people. Oh, they, they, they kept the sheep. Oh, we're going to sacrifice it. That's about like a thief breaking into people's houses. When he gets caught, people, you know, somebody gets in his past and says, what are you doing? He says, well, at least I tithe. I'm stealing, but I tithe and I bring the offering to the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's exactly what's going on here. God said, wipe them all out. And Saul said, well, it was the people, it was the people, it was the people. He's not taking any blame for anything. That's the problem. He's passing on somebody else. Chapter 15, 20. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. No, you haven't. And have gone in the way which the Lord sent me. Yes, you did. You did that. And I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek. Uh Uh-uh, weren't supposed to do that. 21. But the people took the spoil, the sheep, blaming somebody else again. Passing the buck. Blaming, blame, blame, blame. It's them, it's them. Certainly can't be me. I mean, come on. I mean, a person has a bad uh, situation with with 10 different people. And of course, oh, it couldn't be me. All 10 of those got to be wrong. Not me. Not Saul. Blamed others, no admission of wrong, refused to admit wrong, more blame. 24. He knows he's got to confess, but how do I confess without admitting wrong? He knows the pattern. He's been around. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. If there was a period there, he would have done good. But notice the comma. Commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. That is a false confession. That's blaming somebody else again. That's like the, uh, I call them a fundamentalist apology. And when you got an issue, I'm sorry, you misunderstood me because you're just a stupid idiot. (laughs) They don't throw that in there. That's implied. This man has a false confession. God doesn't accept the confession. Verse 30, how do you know it's false? Verse 30, then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now. Whoa, whoa. I have sinned, yet honor me now. He still desires approval of a religious leader without a confession. He's still wanting the attention. It's like there was no wrong ever committed... And people smooth over the offenses, the offensive behavior without correction. You ever deal with that? You ever see that in a family structure? Oh, come on. You need to put that in a past and forget what's done in a past. I have forgotten what's done in a past to a point, but what about confession? You say, whose benefit is for that? For the one who needs to confess. It's not for my benefit. It's for their benefit. Why? They're going down this path. That's not going to bid well for them. It totally confuses children when they see an issue in a house and there's no confession. Just go on like nothing's ever happened. Whoa, what, what, is this th- what is this thing done? Nobody said, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Nothing like that. That is an absolute confusion and that sends confusion to young kids. They got to see somebody's fessing up here. First Sam, or 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, when King David, when, when uh, Naaman, not Naaman, when um, Nathan put his finger in the face of King David about the murder and adultery, David said, I have sinned against the Lord, period. 
It wasn't, well, did you see the way she was dressed? Man, anybody who saw the way Bathsheba was dressed would have, whoa, wait, wow. That's putting blame on somebody else. And you read about David's confession in Psalm 51. A true Bible confession is, I was wrong, please forgive me. That's a Bible apology. And she, this is a subtle, these subtle decisions that Saul made led him down this path. You know, the first step to a reprobate mind is an ungrateful heart. I'm not saying if a person's ungrateful, they're going to end up reprobate, but that's the first step. How does it do people get to a point where they're so deceived? It has been a year's a pattern of this one, this one here, this one here, this one here, no admission here, uh, blame here, blame here. And it says, evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13. Now let's look at the other Saul. The other Saul in Acts 8, you'll read his account, Acts 8 through 28. This man starts off as a religious persecutor. Uh, he had the authority to do it to a point. Deuteronomy chapter 13 was the religious authority under the Jewish covenant. But Paul sure did stretch it. And Paul is a religious persecutor. And anybody knows that religion is the biggest persecutor of people when you watch that path. Jesus even told the apostles in John 16, he said this. He said, there's going to come a time when people who kill you think they could do God's service. Now, Saul, Saul, trained under Judaistic belief system, was killing Christians. But when he was killing Christians, his conscience was saying, boy, you're stretching that passage, Saul. You know it. You know you're stretching it. Are you seeing the reaction of those Christians that you're killing? Watch their reaction. They've got peace. You don't have peace. Your conscience is working on you. You know you're stretching that passage. You can justify yourself, but you're stretching it. And when Jesus Christ showed up, you know what Jesus Christ said to him? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It was his conscience. It was his conscience that was working on him. That inner voice, that inner conscience that God has placed in every individual. And he said, that's it, Saul, that's it. How did this man go from a religious persecutor, 180, and becomes persecuted for the same people he killed? It was his conscience. You want to see what he says about his conscience? That's that one ingredient I'm talking about. Paul writes about that conscience in Acts 23 and multiple places. I'm going to read them. Acts 23, verse 1, in his testimony, he said this. He said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. After he said that, a guy smacked him in the mouth. Who You say, who smacked him? A guy with a bad conscience. Acts 24 Acts 24, he says in verse 16, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and men. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, he writes, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, and so forth down the line. Chapter 4, verse 2, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. He writes to Timothy, his, his convert, convert in the faith. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, listen to this one. Now, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. A good conscience leads to faith unfeigned, not a pretended faith, not a fake faith, not a false faith. It's a faith that a person is constantly trying to adjust because his conscience is saying, you added to that scripture, you subtracted from that scripture, you didn't apply that scripture properly. You may have did the right thing. You did it in the wrong method. Are you going to fess up to your wrong? Are you going to fess up? 
That's that conscience. Chapter 1, verse 19, 1 Timothy, holding faith and a good conscience. Chapter 2, verse 1, or chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 3. He writes again, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with a pure conscience. With a pure conscience. He warned about us defiling our conscience. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When Saul, in the Old Testament, took credit for Jonathan's, Jonathan's victory, a blister developed on his conscience. When Saul would not admit a wrong here and would not admit a wrong here and blame somebody here, that blister popped and became a callus. When he would admit a wrong here, that callus got harder and harder and harder. That conscience got seared. What happened? Titus chapter 1 verse 15. His conscience was so defiled. Chapter 1 15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Paul talked about that conscience. How do we sear and defile our conscience? Take credit for others' work. Justify ourselves, refusal to admit wrong, blame other people instead of blaming ourselves, portraying a false piety, desire for vengeance, false insincere confessions. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13, it states, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Paul was so adamant about this that he even warned about a, an appearance of evil. Not only did he warn about us <clears throat> admitting wrong when evil has been committed, he says even when what you've done appears to be evil, he says get it right. That's pretty fanatical. Why? He wants to have a clean conscience, a pure conscience, a good conscience. Why is that? A pure conscience leads to a proper confession. And when two parties are sinful, as we all are, when wrong is committed, when the one party has committed a wrong and have come out and admitted it, fessed up, I was wrong, please forgive me. Now you can work with that. You can work with that. Why? Because it's, instead of blaming her or her blaming him or them blaming the kids or the kids blaming mom, that blame game is what defiles the conscience. And that's where Saul in the Old Testament started off good <clears throat> with a good conscience and ended up bad with a defiled conscience. And the Apostle Paul, who started off with a good conscience and then he pricked it a few times, ooh, 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 and then he got saved, and then he developed, he got that good conscience back, Acts 23, and he kept that all the way through. A pure conscience leads to a proper confession. A pure conscience will actually help lead a person to a confession when no confession is actually needed. What do you mean by that? When there's a broken fellowship or somebody with a pure conscience will do all they can to reconcile. Even take blame where blame is not necessary. So are you serious? I'm, ex I'm definitely serious. In Daniel chapter 9, you'll read the great confession of, of Daniel. And you'll read it from verse 3 down to 19. And he is confessing all these sins of Israel, all these sins of Israel. You know that man, the next chapter, when he got a message from Gabriel, three times Gabriel said, you are greatly beloved. The man in chapter 10 was told he was greatly beloved as confessing all these sins in chapter 9. Are you kidding me? He is taking upon himself the sins of his nation. In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra has a great prayer. Isn't that interesting? Two chapter 9s. Two men having pure consciences. Men with pure conscience taking the sins of other people, taking it upon themselves. In Ezra chapter 9, Ezra is confessing the sins of the nation of Israel. Had the last great national revival, a post-captivity revival, in Ezra chapter 9, 
This man was said by God to be a ready scribe. Very unique character. Had a great revival because he took upon him the sins of the people. He didn't marry, inter- he didn't marry the wrong people, as was said in chapter 10. He is there taking upon himself, trying to reconcile these people back to God, even though he wasn't the sinner. There are times you do that. Why? Because you do anything to try to reconcile people. Yeah, you say, yeah, but what about them? That's their problem. I'm trying to keep my conscience pure. It's up to them on their conscience. They got to work on their own conscience. I got to live with mine. I got to put my head on a pillow at night. And live with my conscience. I want a straight bed. I don't want a crooked bed. Some people are so crooked they can jump through a fish hook of, of hooks and come through without even touching anything. Why? They got a defiled conscience. That conscience will allow two people who had an issue, the conscience of both parties, admission of wrong, will help them reconcile. And maintain a long-term relationship. In 2 Kings chapter 22, the last great revival that Judah experienced was under a young fellow named Josiah. And the reason why Josiah was, ta- was spoken to of the Lord, he talked about all the sins of Judah. And he said, Josiah, because I saw your heart was tender. And you humbled yourself in the sight of the Lord. Every believer needs to have a tender heart towards God, a tough hide towards man. Now, that tough hide towards man, we're willing to listen to their criticisms of our blind spots and truly consider them. Take that to the God of heaven and say, Lord, what about that? Are they beeping in that blind spot trying to avoid an accident? Well, Lord, I want to avoid that accident. Okay, that's what a tender heart will do. You say, oh, I'm not willing to do something like that. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you know what he did? Isaiah 53, he said, he took your griefs upon him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin became sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in him. There are times you should take other sins in order to reconcile. A sincere desire for a joyful fellowship overrides defense of myself. Well, I've got to defend myself. What for? Well, I didn't deserve that. I know you deserve worse. Don't we deserve hell? I would dare say. A pure conscience is what will help a long-term relationship. Why? Because we know there's going to be offenses. We know that. We know that we're going to mess up. But the response after that's the key. What are we going to do with it? Admit it? God's right. I'm wrong. Yeah, I admit that. I was dead wrong. I was dead wrong. My job is to confess and forsake. When I see confession and forsake, 1 Peter 5, 8 steps in, and it says, Charity covereth. A multitude of sins. When Simon Peter confessed and forsook in John 21 when he confessed to Jesus, after that, the Lord Jesus never brought it up again. There's no record of it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from most unrighteousness. All of it. Man, we got a glorious God. Amazing to admire the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you just got to admire the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to close on that one hymn. What's the one hymn about our Savior? Anybody know that one? Jen, could you come and play that one? What a Savior. What a Savior. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Anybody got that number? What is it? 127. Shall we stand and let's sing this? About the Lord Jesus Christ. And actually in that song <clears throat> where it says hallelujah, we're kind of thinking, wow, what a Savior. What a Savior. 127. Hallelujah, what a 
Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, hallelujah, what a Savior, <clears throat> guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he, full atonement, can it be, hallelujah, what a Savior, <clears throat> lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry, Him exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior, when he comes our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring. Then anew this song will sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Shall we pray? Lord, I do thank you that you have taken our sins upon us. And Lord, I do pray that you'd help us as sinners, saved by grace. Help us to admit when we're wrong. Help us to keep a pure conscience. When we get those blisters, those pricks in our conscience, help us to settle it, get it right, so that we might have a tender heart towards Thee and to live a life void of offense toward God and man. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.